Parashat Tetzaveh, our Torah portion for this week, is the only sedra from the beginning of the book of Exodus to the end of Deuteronomy, where the name of Moses does not appear once. Many rabbinic reasons are offered for this absence. One theory is that this omission is an acknowledgement of the anniversary of Moses' death, which the rabbis worked out fell on the 7th of Adar, that would have been this week. Another theory is that it is a divine admonishment for Moses' jealousy, nowhere evidence in the, evident in the Torah, over Aaron's appointment as high priest. Still others maintain that it's Moses' humility and self-effacement. Moses, Moses graciously cedes the role to his brother of high priest and absents himself from the narrative, so to speak, to make this clear. Despite his absence, Moses is certainly behind the scenes in this parasha, and it's clear that when God is speaking, he is speaking to Moses. The Torah portion opens with the words, Ba'ata tetzaveh et b'nei Yisrael, you, you yourself, says God, shall further instruct the Israelites. He's absent, but he's also present. He's a hidden mediator between God and Israel bringing the people the message to create the sanctuary in the desert, something beautiful, detailed, of aesthetic value, but also with the purpose of serving God. There is perhaps no link between this portion for this week and the next thing I'm about to say, other than a very tenuous connection between the rabbinic dating of Moses' death and the subject of resurrection, which you wouldn't hear very often from this pulpit. So please don't close your eyes or switch off your computers when I mention the R word, but bear with me just for a moment. The blessing we read a few moments ago, Atagibor, the second blessing of the Tefillah, is known as the Guburot, which means power or might. It's about God's power over nature, the might of his love, compassion, and strength. But this blessing, when you drill down and ask yourself what it really means, is about resurrection. Summed up in the last sentence, Baruch Ata Adonai, Mechaye Hametim. Our translation in the prayer book offers an interpretative paraphrase of the Hebrew rather than a literal translation. We praise you, O God, source of eternal life. But what the phrase really means, literally, is we praise you, O God, who quicken the dead, or who brings life to the dead, Mechaye. Service of the heart, the siddur which preceded our current Siddur, Siddur Lev Chadash, changed the Hebrew of this closing eulogy, concluding eulogy, Chatima in Hebrew, of this blessing, in line with many progressive liturgies, to reflect the rejection of the idea of bodily resurrection, something progressive Jews do not subscribe to. So in the old prayer book, the prayer book that I grew up with, we used to pray, Baruch Ata Adonai, Hanotea Batochenu, Chaye Olam. That whole closing phrase was changed. We praise you, O God, who implants within us eternal life. How the traditional version, Mechaye Hametim, who quickens the dead, traditionally, made a comeback into Siddur Lev Chadash, need not concern us today. But it returned, not with its literal translation, but with a paraphrase that expressed faith in the immortality of the soul and a belief in the afterlife. And it also gave worshippers the freedom to interpret that phrase in a way that allowed us to, allows us 
to cherish the memories of those who have died and bring those memories to life. Resurrection, tchiat tamitim in Hebrew, a concept that came into Judaism during Hellenistic times, was something of a theological battleground by the Middle Ages. And even though Maimonides, the great philosopher of the 12th century, included Tchiat Hametim, resurrection, as one of his 13 principles, there were still those who accused him of denying this theological belief because of how he expressed himself. And then, as I just mentioned, progressive Jews eliminated the concept from their prayer books altogether while retaining the hope in an afterlife. Resurrection, that curious word, can mean different things to different people. Some years ago, I encountered one of our members, a refugee, who referred to his escape from Nazi Germany as a resurrection. Being a refugee, he said, was a, ref a resurrection. It was perhaps a curious choice of words, but there was no doubt that he was saying something about the way in which oppression and displacement had paradoxically strengthened his Jewish identity. He valued deeply the liberal Jewish tradition, and although so much of the past had been devastated and lost, he felt that liberal Judaism had had a role in helping to renew his place in society. I've held on to those words for a long time, not only because they've given me a different understanding of the term resurrection, but because for this man, the building of his family here in England, the birth of his sons, his grandchildren and great-grandchildren, represented for him resurrection, the future of the Jewish people. And yesterday, I had a similar experience in Winchester, the unveiling of a statue of a 13th century Jewish businesswoman, Licorisha of Winchester. This little known woman, twice married with five children and running one of the few businesses that Jews could engage in at that time, money lending, has today been resurrected by historians archivists, patrons, individuals who've been telling her story, creating an educational curriculum from her life, and allowing her to become a means to educate people about the contributions that minorities have made in this country, about diversity, tolerance, understanding, harmony, and friendship. Her story has lain dormant and scarcely known even by the Jewish community, let alone the general public, for more than seven centuries. But yesterday, as I spoke to the children of a local community school, I was impressed how well-versed they were in Licorice's story, and I was moved to think that in a town where there are scarcely any Jews, no synagogue, and probably a fair bit of ignorance about Judaism and the Jewish people. She has, so to speak, been resurrected from her anonymous grave to a life in a world that she could never have dreamed of. The past yields its secrets, and resurrection of the dead can mean something to all of us, not in the sense that we will be bodily resurrected after our death, but that memory and history can inject us with new life and new energy and new purpose. Absence becomes present in the way the dead can become a stimulus, helping us to create a vision of the world like that of the sponsors of the Licorice of Winchester project a statue, the educational curriculum, a vision of a diverse, compassionate, tolerant, harmonious, and enlightened world.